mental expectation for your players that you'll be having and what that would look like for them when they go out? Yeah, I think the biggest thing for for guys, especially younger guys, but you know, for us, we're going to be in a situation where everyone is kind of new to the program. It's just being able to, to learn from mistakes. You know, you bring up mental health and mental toughness and all those things. Like, you know, a book that impacted me was Grit by Angela Duckworth. And, you know, she describes grit as passion plus perseverance. And so the people that are usually successful in life, it's not because of any special skill or talent. It's because they just handle adversity better than others. So, like, the big thing for us is going to be able to compete and respond. You know, that's, that's the mental toughness that we're looking for. If we win the play, great, respond. If we lose the play, great, respond. And then what can we draw from that experience? If we make a mistake, because we're going to make mistakes, like, how do we respond to that mistake and how do we get better from it? So from a mental standpoting, that's really what we're looking for. Great, great, thank you. What attracted you to, to Michigan State and or Jonathan Smith? Well, two things. Number one, first off, I was seven years at Minnesota and it was a great experience. And, and PJ and, and the staff there was awesome. And it was a really tough decision to leave. Um, and it was going to be something that was going to be a great situation in my mind to, to make the move. Uh, but, but two things about Michigan State. Number one, I, I think it can be special. Um, they've been in the college football playoff, and it's been recent and won conference championships. Um, so I think that's the first thing. And then the second thing is um, just everything I heard about, and, and Coach Smith and I hadn't worked together before, but everything I heard about him from other college coaches, from NFL scouts, from people in the profession was that, you know, you couldn't work for a better guy. And then getting to know him through the process, um, I felt that. That was kind of what my gut said. And then being here for two and a half months, it, it, it's, it's held true. Like, I, I don't know that you'll find a better guy in the profession. Like, he's, he's awesome to work for. Um, he's going to represent the program the way, way, right way. He's going to be a great leader for our players and our staff. So th those two things were huge for me. I, I'm wondering how much, because you obviously faced Michigan State last year, how much did you kind of get an idea of the personnel before you came in here, with, particularly the younger guys that, that were on the roster? Yeah, so obviously I was more familiar with the offense. Yeah. Um, because that's who we had kind of competed against. You know, I, I did get a chance, obviously, you go through um, a year and you get crossover film where, hey, you're getting ready for an offense and you see another team. So I did see the defense a little bit. I knew there was uh, a good amount of guys coming back. Um, I was able to watch a little bit of film before. Um, and then obviously once you get here, you know, that was one of the, the top things that we did is just put on tape and watch guys and evaluate them. Um, you're not worried about scheme. You're not worried about any of that. You're just putting film on and watching guys play. Um, so that was kind of the process. Were you able to share some of that intel that you had from scouting with Brian about what the offense he'd got and what some of those? No, honestly, no, because they're gonna they're doing the same thing. They're putting it on like everything that we have is more of like schematics and tendencies and tips, and those things kind of get thrown out the window when there's a new offense or new defense. When you were at Teal and Maine, I've heard you say that you graduated a lot of guys and had brand new personnel. You mentioned a moment ago that uh, there's not as much of a, of a, of a players leaving. You've got more players coming back. How, did, how is that unique in terms of the challenge? You got some experience, you got some returning players, but it's not a complete yeah. losing players. If I'm not, if I'm not, if I'm accurate about what you said. Yeah, well, you know, the, the thing that I found over the years is when when you have success at places like Teal and like Maine, which are not um, those were not quote unquote the top jobs in the league, and I was fortunate to be a part of some some, some good teams when we were there. It you know what you found is those teams recruited and then developed their players well. I think development is the undervalued thing in college football. Like you can recruit, but you got to develop, right? And I think developmental programs are the ones that have lasting success. And so at those two places, that's what we had to do. Um, and when we had experienced guys, that's usually when we kind of had our most success. Uh, college football, in my opinion, has changed in the last four or five years because there's much more turnover on a roster than there was, say, six years ago. Um, you don't really know who's your roster isn't set until June, which is a different dynamic. 
So like that developmental process has kind of changed a little bit with transfers and things of that nature. So, you know, I think when you come into a program for the first time and you're installing the defense for the first time, everyone's on the same starting point. Um, so that is a little bit of difference. So even though there are some guys coming back with experience, they're learning this defense for the first time. They're learning our culture for the first time as a football program. So uh, there's a little bit of a, a learning curve for them. Now, listen, an experienced player is going to learn faster than a first year guy. That's just natural because they've been through it before. But it is a little different situation in year one than it is in, say, year four or five. I want to a little bit about your past. You, you obviously went to work for PJ. Yeah. Um, as a defensive guy, how is that in terms of working for an offensive minded head coach? And how much ownership can you take in your defense if, if under the when when the, the head coach is got more eyeballs i say maybe on the, the other side of the ball yeah i i think here here's the thing like obviously i'm i'm getting with coach smith for the first time but just he painted a very vivid picture of what he was looking for and what he values obviously you mentioned uh, Coach Fleck, who I'd worked for before, I think the one thing that, that, that I feel similar between them is they value winning football games um, and they value playing complementary football. And so um, I think that what, what you'll see in that standpoint is like when, when, a, when a head coach values that, decisions that they're making are with the end in mind of winning the game offense, defense, and special teams, understanding situations, understanding clocks, understanding is it a one score lead, two score lead, three score lead, and all the gameplay that goes into that. And just having conversations with Coach Smith, like I, I know that's really important to him. So for me, as a, a defensive play caller, that tells me like, hey, listen, you've got to do a good job managing situations so that we can put ourselves in position to win the most football games possible. Um, I think it's all it, working for offensive guys. Like they can give you maybe a perspective that you don't have because they're offensive guys. Um, and you know, I thought that uh, my prior boss, Coach Fleck, did a good job with that. And Coach Smith has already shown himself to be able to do that. And his will be at a little bit different level because he was a quarterback. And not only you know he was a quarterback, he's a pretty darn good one. So I think that that will you know uh, be something that I'll love to be able to talk to him and get the, inside the quarterback's head. You go back 60 years in this program, the championship teams have been dominant defensive teams. Yeah. But in the evolution of college football now, as offensive as it's become, yeah. how difficult is it to, 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 to build a dominant defense? Yeah, I, I think to me, like, you're right. Like if you go back through the years, you know, in the in the fifties and sixties, yeah. you know, defense was maybe a, a little bit more dominant, to use your words, uh, than it is now. But I still believe you can play really, really good defense, and I think the top teams still play really, really good defense. I think what you got to do is what do you value in terms of playing really, really good defense in, in 2024? And for us and for me, it's it's eliminating explosive plays. Um, you know, the top offenses in the country are able to get chunk plays. Um, and so when they create chunk plays, their scoring probability goes up. And so for us defensively, we, you know, we want to eliminate those. And when we've played really good defense over the years on teams that I've been a part of and been in the top 25 or top 10, it's been the result of not giving up a lot of explosives and making people drive the length of the field and making them earn everything that they get. And if you look at that and we chart that, you'll find that the top defenses in the country give up the least amount of explosive plays. So that's something that we'll value. Joe, you mentioned uh, the Big Ten and maybe just being a Pittsburgh guy. I'm guessing maybe you probably have an appreciation for sort of the history of defense here. The 2010s, you probably saw some that you lost before you got in. Your stance on the history of high-level defense being played with this program specifically, I guess, is that something that you have a familiarity with? Yeah, I think so. When, when, when we first came into the league at Rutgers, I was at Rutgers for a little bit. Uh, I think there were some really good Michigan State defenses, and I know the, uh, uh, in the past, and with Coach D'Antonio uh, and Coach Narduzzi, like they've put up some some really good defenses over the years. And I think it, it comes down to number one, you've got a, a, some talented players. That's part of it, right? It always starts with talent, uh, but then also it's a, a mentality, and it's a it's a physicality, and it's a it's a commitment to fundamentals and. And, and, and I certainly appreciate and respect that, and that's something that we're going to strive to do. You coached for Kyle Flood at Rutgers. He's an offensive line type of coach, or offensive line coach background. 
Where did you hone your defensive philosophy from? Which which coaches did you steal from and so forth, like they say in the business? Yeah, I, all of them, you know, and I would say that, like, my my first, you know, coaching job was at, was at Teal College, as you mentioned, and my uh, defensive coordinator had taken the head coach job, and that was Jack Liepheimer. And, you know, we, we don't necessarily run the schemes that we ran back then, but a lot of the how we do things, maybe the what wasn't the same, but how we do it, how we implement it, how we teach it, the, the value on fundamentals, playing hard, running to the ball, uh, keeping the ball in front, you know, those things were from that whole journey of, you know, Coach Liepheimer and then uh, going to University of Maine and coaching under Coach Cosgrove. Um, those guys kind of built it and then just all the people that you come in contact over the years, whether it's um, on another staff or guys you work with, it all kind of comes together. Um, but that those would be the guys. Joe, so you mentioned a fair number of guys back. Mm -hmm. uh, when they have given up 129 points to Michigan, Ohio State, Penn State, where do you start? What's the job one? Is it the physical? Is it the psychological? Yeah, so like I told those guys and, 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 and like we're evaluating on and on now and and then in the future, you know. And so the the those things we're we're not necessarily worried about. They're there. We acknowledge them. But like we're evaluating guys on everything that's going on day to day. The thing I would tell you for us that we value is three things. We got to be able to stop the run. You know, I think. You know, you talk about being able to have success in the Big Ten. It comes down to being able to stop the run, especially as you get later in the year. So that's number one. Number two is eliminate explosive plays, which we kind of touched on. And then three is create takeaways. I think that the best defenses are able to create takeaways. That being said, you know, those three things, there's a lot of things that go into that into being able to do those three things. And I think number one is being able to play really, really hard. Uh, and the, the, the best defenses that I've been around over the years played really, really hard. I, I felt like that they were really tough um, mentally. You know, the question was asked earlier about the mental toughness and being able to handle adverse situations. Um, and then I thought they played with great technique. Um, so playing really hard, playing physical and tough, and playing with great technique will be the things we'll be preaching to the guys to stop the run, eliminate explosives, and create takeaways. How does a coach get his defense to create takeaways? We've had teams here that you know, fly zone, nobody could do anything. We've had others where we preach about the ball, they wear shirts, they talk about it all the yeah. time, they get two interceptions in a season. Yeah. How does a coach handle that? Right? Yeah, I, I think there's the, the coaching of the fundamentals, and then I think there's the constant reminders about getting the ball out um, and some of it's scheme related um, you know zone coverage generally leads to more interceptions than man coverage um, I think more times than not fumbles in, in today's football are the result of people punching the ball out um, so there's that and then I think executing at a high level if I could just be frank about it is like if you play your defense at a really high level your chances of creating takeaways are going to be greater than if you're not playing it at a high level. So, you know, we're going to coach all of those things to the best of our ability. And, you know, you know, I, I've seen over the years, you know, some teams who have a great knack at it and some don't, but I believe all of them can get better at it by coaching those things. So you went through last year's film cut-ups, even practice and so forth, to get an idea about the personnel coming back? You looked at that? Or? We watched game film of, of the guys coming back. And, you know, and I'm going to be honest, like, I, I watched it on individual players. Like, I'm not watching for scheme. I'm not watching for any of that. I don't – I'm not worried about that. I'm just watching players to get a feel what their strengths and their weaknesses are um, and how they'll fit into our, our scheme. I'm wondering about the – recruiting because I mean that's obviously something that the previous staff kind of I mean the big knock on them locally was that they abandoned Ohio and that had built a lot of the big defenses I guess having ties to this region yeah with a staff that doesn't have ties sure. to this region, how do you try and tell them this is this is how we can do it where we can build in this this region yeah I well I think the first thing is you know just getting boots on the ground and getting coaches in the in the in the, in the schools um, we made it a huge point of emphasis to be in the Midwest uh, this this last recruiting cycle uh, and, and I know coach wants that to continue and will continue um, you know just me personally as as a coordinator you know <laughs> I mean I was in Ohio I was in Illinois I was in Michigan um, and those were the main areas that they kind of had me getting. So speak into what you're talking about, because I think there's some really good football played in that area and some really tough players. So, What, what is, going back to when you first took this job, what was the, just the most enticing part of this opportunity? Yeah, I, I think, 
you know, I, I kind of mentioned earlier, I had a, a situation where I was in a good situation working for a good guy against a team that had had some success. So making the move for me was going to be about something where, like, hey, wh wh what, 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 is, what is special about the place you're going to? And for this place, to me, it's you can play in the college football playoff. You can win Big Ten championships. Um, there has been a tradition of playing really good defense. And then the other huge draw was working for Coach Smith because everything I kind of heard about him was like that he is awesome to work for and runs a really good program. And, you know, as an assistant coach, um, a lot of your your experience is going to be dictated by who you work for. And it's a great profession, but the, the, the how the profession affects you personally and your and your family depends on who, who the head coach is. And uh, I, I work for a really, really good one. And, um, you know, so that was that was exciting. Is there something exciting also about being like this program is at a total rip down the suds and it's going to need to be rebuilt? Is there something like being a coordinator, having that responsibility to kind of implement what you want to do? And it's like a whole new fresh start. Is that something that also was, you know, I'd say it creates a different challenge. Each year has its own challenges, right? So there is a challenge to starting over. Like all the all the freshmen are hearing it for the first time, but so are the fifth year seniors. You know, a guy I know, you know that I, that I coach, Cal Halliday. I mean, he's started a lot of football games, but he's hearing it for the first time. Um, so there is a challenge to that, and uh, it's just it's it's almost like working a different muscle. Um, so to speak. So it, it, it is exciting. I think anytime you get in those types of situations, it's exciting to, to install something for the first time, but it's also a challenge. You know, and so. I've inherited some defensive coaches, which isn't always the norm, but just how's that been? And getting to know those guys, them getting to know you, love your scheme, how they. Yeah, I, I think a, a couple things. Like, obviously, Coach Lange and, and Coach Blue Adams, like, those guys worked for Coach Smith. And the thing that really has stuck out to me is, like, the. He, he has top-notch people around him. And so, like, I got a chance to see that just quickly. Anyone that he brought with him is just been – I've been impressed with. And um, and so th that – that those guys have been great. They have great football knowledge. They have great experience. They're great human beings. So it's been awesome to, to work with them. Obviously, we made some other hires, um, you know, Demetrius Martin, who's 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 an alum um, and has a great resume, and he's an awesome guy. And then Chad Wilt, who you know I'd been with before, so there's some so, so there's some you know common ground there. So it's been really good because at the end of the day, they're all really good coaches and really good people. You really have to adapt your personnel, but from a big picture standpoint, will what we see this year look like what we saw in Minnesota for the most part, I guess? Or yeah, you're not gonna lift the curtain on everything. Yeah, I think the fundamentals and the belief system will be the same. You know, I've been this is I think year 24. And so, like, you got to tailor what you do to the strengths and weaknesses of your defense. Um, you know, I worked with Ralph Friedgen in the last year that he coached. And uh, I said, Coach, what are you going to run? And he goes, I don't know. I said, what, what, what do you mean, Coach? And he goes, I, Joe, I've run a lot of plays over the years. He goes, the ones we'll run here are the ones that our players can do well. And I said, you know what? That's pretty damn smart. <laughs> and um, so whereas you don't necessarily pick plays on defense, but you do pick schemes and you do tailor things to the strengths and weaknesses of the, of the people that, that you have. And so that's going to be a constant evaluation this spring is what are we good at, what are we not? Let's yeah. lean towards the things we're good at. Let's kind of shy away from the things we're not. So is it going to look exactly the same? No, because every year there it kind of tweaked a little bit too based on what we had. You mentioned Cal. Um, leaders right now I mean I'm getting to know these guys who's kind of maybe stood out in that group that that are both vocal and physical leaders right now. yeah I mean it, we're still I'm gonna be on we're, yeah. we're still filling it out we're still learning guys like I mentioned him because he's in my room I coach the linebackers and I know he's played a lot of games and you know they're in strength and conditioning and they're able to do some drills and we're getting into spring practice so we're still kind of sorting all that out I like the group I will tell you they're eager and they're willing um, and that, as a coach, anytime you get a group like that, that's exciting. Is that kind of a feeling out process when you mention that? Like, kind of, as a coach, do you want to kind of see, okay, we're going to put you in some challenging situations with this changeover? Who's going to rise? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think it's easy to lead when things are going well. It's hard to lead when things aren't going well. That's player, that's coach, that's anything in life. So, you know, generally speaking, at this time of year, it's lifting, it's conditioning. And, you know, while it's hard, you know, you, when we get to football, we'll get a little bit better feel for who the guys are that you can, you know, that can kind of step up and be leaders. Before you coach Joe Rossi football, you have to uncoach some things. You have to strip them down 
and get rid of some bad habits? You know, I don't necessarily look at it that way in terms of we come in, we communicate what we're looking for, and we're going to hold them to that standard. And so whether that's a quote-unquote bad habit or something that hasn't been coached or something that has been coached, it, it really, to me, doesn't matter. It's just this is what we're looking for. This is what it looks like. Like, I'm a big believer in, hey, communicate what you want it to look like. Show evidence of what, you know, visually. You've told them, and now you're visually going to show it to them and then hold them accountable to it. And holding accountable doesn't mean it's negative. It's just making sure you're working towards the standard of what it needs to look like. And when it doesn't look that way, communicate what it needs to look like. So, like I said, I don't see it as like breaking bad habits or stripping down. I just see it as here's what we want it to look like. Let's work to get it there. You mentioned working with PJ. What's the most important thing you learned from him? Holding the standard, uh, communicating the vision, and holding the standard. Um, I think he does a really good job of communicating what he wants it to look like. Um, you know, in, in casting a vision and then holding people to that standard to make it look that way. That's what I would say I learned most. Can any assistant coach match his enthusiasm? Uh, I think they can in, in their own way. Um, and, and what I mean by that is like, you know, you'll get around me, I'm not as necessarily, uh, uh, my, 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 my enthusiasm doesn't come out maybe the same way that his did, but uh, I, I think it does come out. So I think we had a staff of guys who, you know, we're enthusiastic in their own way. When you talk about uh, complimentary football with Brian, I mean, the idea that I mean, the last couple of years that here, the offense wasn't able to stay on the field. The yeah. defense was exposed to a lot of plays. Um, yeah. How much have you guys talked about, you know, like syncing that up so that, you know, the defense isn't really hung out to dry? Yeah, so um, here's what I would say. That conversation kind of stems from the head football coach. And so, you know, I've talked to coach about that and what his vision is and what his – how he how we're going to play the game um and then when we when we kind of get into the nitty-gritty of getting into spring practice and fall practice and as we're working those conversations get had in staff rooms uh led by the head coach and then you know you kind of give your feedback as a coordinator and so i do know that He's been awesome and just getting to know him and, and, and spend some time with him and communicating him. And I know he and I are going to work really well together because uh, he's a good guy. Uh, and at the end of the day, he wants to win football games, which is the same thing we all want to do. And uh, so I, I think that, you know, playing complimentary football is the number one thing. You know, it, it isn't about stats. It isn't about anything other than the W, getting the W and winning football games. So I'm excited to work with him. But I, those conversations have been more with coaches. It, as we've kind of gotten into it. You seem to run a bunch of malleable kind of fronts. I mean, a three got three front, and then sometimes a, or a four front, and then it looks like a three, and then uh, overhang linebackers, and then also the um, you cover six concept, or you have you know kind of a split zone and man. I mean, can you talk about how much you're going to be able to do with that in that first year? I mean, or is it going to be? You know, trying to kind of get some of the basics down and then yeah. expanding it over time. Yeah, I, I would say I don't know. Yeah. And, and I say that. <laughs> it isn't that I don't know. Yeah. It's I don't know what they're going to know yet. Yeah. Okay, so the, 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 what we do will be determined by how much we can handle. Um, so is it all going to be in? I don't know yet. We're, we're, we're going to be in the process of figuring that all out. I will tell you that, you know, to me, if you're going to make a decision, do you err on too much? or maybe you hold back a little bit more. I would hold back a little bit more because no one plays good defense with baking a bunch of mistakes and, and busting coverages. That's not how you play good defense. That's, that's not good for anyone. So, you know, how much is in, how much isn't, I don't know right now. It's just as we get a chance to coach him and be around him and spend time with him and see him in a meeting room, then we can figure that out. What was the comparison between the end of your time in Minnesota the start as far as how much how big the menu was each year depended like i'm going to give you just an example like in in 21 and 22 there we had a bunch of experienced guys back okay last year we were really young and had a lot of injuries so 23 was a lot different than 21 to 22. it isn't like the nfl where these guys are under contract for five years you know like every year like that experience level is going to be different like you know so, so to me, like it just varies from year to year. But I will say, over the course of time, in year four or five, you're going to obviously feel more comfortable than you are in year year one. What did you call the base defense the last couple of years at Minnesota? Like you said, three down linemen, but Stigo was about six five, two fifty five standing up. It looked like a four three over. But yeah. what did you call it? 
I mean, there's a four two five four three. You know, we played with a hybrid end. Um, you know, that rush end who has the ability to rush, he has the ability to drop into coverage, he has the ability to create a three down front. Um, you know, sometimes he plays off the ball in passing situations and can able add into different gaps and things of that. So, you know, it, it's based out of a four two five four three, but I think there's a little bit of flexibility because of that player you mentioned, Danny Strigo. Um, before that was Boye Mafe. Um, before that was Carter Coughlin. Uh, that position in the defense has been a successful player in terms of production in the league. Uh, and both those guys I mentioned are already in the NFL. Thomas Rush was on the practice squad this year uh, with the Titans. So that's been a, 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 an important part of uh, and piece of the equation for us. And then us. when you play at Wisconsin and Illinois, they can, you can morph into more of a you know, physical, traditional 4-3 sure. type of thing. Absolutely. Speaking of, uh, the, last, uh, last speaking of the developmental program, I mean, um, you know, the, the, the Michigan State, I guess it was three or four years, hadn't really produced many defenders that have gone on the NFL. How important is that to kind of establish here, especially just from a recruiting perspective? Yeah, I, I think here, here's what I would say. Guys going to the NFL means they're playing really well. Playing really well means we're going to be winning football games. So, you know, it, it, it isn't the, the goal to just say, hey, I'm producing an NFL guy. The goal is to produce guys that play really, really well. And if you play really, really well, then you'll probably be a guy that the NFL is attracted to. And then that's naturally going to bring in recruits who see you've developed people. To me, the number one thing that recruits should be asking is how well am I going to be developed? Okay, because at the end of the day, how well you're developed is going to determine your success in college and it's going to determine your success at the next level. And um, I think that that goes down to culture, that goes down to teaching, that goes down to accountability, that goes down into the standards and how hard guys. But it starts with the product that you're bringing in in terms of recruiting well. So I think it's just a reoccurring cycle, like come in, develop them, they get an opportunity to go have success in the NFL, recruits see it, they feel it, and they say, hey, I want to be in a place that's going to develop me. The last thing, yeah, um, you talked about recruiting being in the Midwest here and knowing that Michigan State can win a championship and be in the in BCS. How are you selling this school when you go in there now? You don't have all the knowledge of some people, but you certainly played against them. What's your pitch? Yeah, well, I, I think the first thing is you talk about what has been done here and what the tradition is and the, the things that can be done. I think you talk about Coach Smith and the success that he's had uh, as a program, you know, taking a program that had run, I think, one game the, the, the year before he was there and then was a you know, two-time 25 team. I think you talk about what was done there and then what can be done here with maybe more resources in an area that's a more fertile recruiting ground. I think defensively, you know, we talk about some of the things we were able to do at the last place and some of the players we were able to put in the NFL, knowing here has more resources and, again, a little bit more of a fertile recruiting ground. All right, thanks. Thank you.